Uh, if you haven't been with us, this is how things go here a little bit. If you've been here, now's your time. Go ahead and pull this out. We've got our uh, QR code up here. Um, if you would just, if this, you've been here a million times, just give us your name and we're good to go. If, if uh, you have never been here before, if you fill this out, we're not coming to your house. We're not going to knock on your door. We're not going to call you. We're not going to anything else. But it gives us information so we can check in on you. If you become part of the family and you're gone for a few weeks, we want to say, hey, you guys doing all right? You're like, I'm on vacation for the next month. It's like, man, bring me a souvenir. That's fantastic. Um, but sometimes people get sick and they don't tell anybody. And then we call and they're like, uh, yeah, I just had surgery. And we're like, can we arrange meals? Can we do something to help out? So we are a relational church and we like to take care of each other. So if you'll pull that out and do that real quick on your phone, if this is your first time, take a screenshot. We got a gas card for you out front. You can use it. You can give it away. Whatever you'd like to do, um, you can do that. But here is your opportunity. All right. We're good. We're almost there. Okay. I heard, Scott, you go through that a little bit fast, and we can't get our phones out. We can't do it. And I'm like, okay, so let's do that. One of the things to put on your calendar, there's also on the seats in front of you or the door frames on your way out. Um, but one of the things we want you to put on your calendar is, it's sort of crazy. Like I heard this when I was younger, and the older I get, the more true it becomes. The days are long and the years are short. And it's like, when I heard that when I was young, I was like, that may be the dumbest statement I've ever heard in my life. And now I'm getting older, I'm like, wow, that, that's no joke. That's no joke. This year we celebrate 15 years as a church. Yeah. Put that on your calendar. We're going to be here. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have uh, food afterwards. we got some great door prizes. You just show up. We're giving you cool stuff. We're bringing in great food. We're not asking anybody here to cook anything or serve anything. We just want you to show up and enjoy. Uh, the other thing, I didn't think about this. Some of you guys have been around a really long time. If you've got some of those good pictures from the early days, send me those because uh, we would like to share that with everybody. I have found a few myself as I'm going back through there, and I'm like, yes, this will be fun to see their face when they see this picture. After 15 years, uh, it'll be a good time, but if you have any of those, go ahead and send those to me on Facebook or text, whatever you've got of mine. That, uh, we'll have fun with that. Okay, so we're going to get into this today, um, but I don't know how many of you guys know, my, my wife uh, runs the kindergarten through fifth grade area over here, so I'm going to ask you guys all to keep a secret. You cannot tell my wife because she was like, Scott, when's the last time you did an evangelist? Like you told somebody what it was to follow Jesus. I'm like, I do that all the time. What are you talking about? And I started thinking like, no, we talk a lot about what it is to follow Jesus and what we're supposed to be doing once you're already following Jesus. But how do I know if I'm following Jesus? What are the steps I'm supposed to take to follow Jesus? I'm like, man, I haven't done that in a while. Have I? I just, I don't know why. So you can't tell her it's because of her that I'm doing this sermon. That, that is the, we're swearing this to secrecy because I don't need, I told you, I'm fat, glad you finally listened to me. It's like, that's my imitation of my wife. She don't really sound like that. In my head sometimes she does, but it's good. So we are going to be talking about what it is to follow Jesus and what does scripture say about following Jesus. And when you start looking at scripture a little bit, like there are so many people that have opinions on what it means to follow Jesus and what do I have to do to follow Jesus? And some of them are like rigorous. And then some of them are like, oh, it's almost nothing at all. And it's like, but what does scripture say about this? So we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture today. You might want to write these down, um, take them home with you. Go look at this yourself. Don't just trust me on this because that's where you'll get in trouble. Because we're going to be looking at a ton of scripture, and I want to make sure you get this right, and I want to make sure I get this right. Because James chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I know this. Every time I get up here, every time I lead a group, anytime I lead a Bible study, anytime I'm talking to any of you, I know that I'm held to a higher standard because I'm a teacher. I recognize this. So I do everything I can to get it right. I'm 20 years into this. Think about when you started your job 20 years ago. Are you better now than you were before? <laughs> Did Maybe you thought some things at the beginning that now you're like, I was close. I was close. 
but I'm getting a little more dialed in the older I get, the further I go into my job. So I'm realizing like this has happened to me. So I want you guys, like, as you're walking along with Jesus, those of you who have been following him, you know, since 1910, you know who you are, you know, so those, does this line up with what you were taught or not? And then go back and say, okay, were they telling me what they thought or telling me what scripture said? So we're going to get into that today. Uh, in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus is teaching about who can follow Jesus. Because you got to get this in context, right? So he's talking about who can follow Jesus, then why we should follow Jesus. Then finally, he starts talking about people who think they are following Jesus. And you're going to fall into one of these categories. But when you look at this, in, in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13, he's talking about how uh, maybe it's not as easy as we thought it would be. Verse 13, it says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the great gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only few will find that. Hmm. So it seems to me that Jesus is saying, there's a whole bunch of people that say they're following me, and they believe that they're following me. Actually, they're not really following me. It's like, that seems odd. Because I know when I start, first started preaching, like, Jesus was the solve to everything. Like, you know, I just need more money if you just follow Jesus. You know, I, I just need a, a, a prettier wife. Just follow Jesus. Like, then she, all of a sudden you wake up, it's like, man, that girl looks good. Like, I need more flavor in my food. Like, just follow Jesus. It's good. That's all you got to do is just follow Jesus. It's going to be fine. But as I read scripture a little bit more, it's like, Maybe it doesn't matter so much about what I believe, but since he's in charge of who gets in and who doesn't, maybe we should talk to him about what he believes. And it seems like there's a whole bunch of people on this wide road, in this big gate, that think they're getting in, but small is the gate and narrow in the, is the road that leads to life, and only few will find it. It's like, maybe I should dial in a little bit here. And then we get to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So there are a lot of people who are saying he is my Lord, right? He is not just my Savior. He just saved me from sin. But I'm also saying he is my Lord. He is in charge of my life. He gets to say what I do and what I don't do anymore. And a lot of people are saying it, but maybe they aren't living it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father. I like seeing action words, right? Let's keep it simple, stupid. Like I can think all kinds of stuff, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But he was like, how about you do these things? And I'm like, now I can make a list, right? Like, let's get this right. And he goes on here in verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. I'm like, that's next level. I, I don't believe I've driven out any demons. I, as, as far as I know, I have witnessed a couple miracles, but I have not been involved in performing miracles. Other people had driven out demons and performed miracles in the name of Jesus, and he was like, Y'all was just saying my name. I don't have any idea who you are. My name is powerful. But I don't know you at all. And you think you're getting in because you used the power of my name. But maybe uh, Jesus believes that some people ain't getting in. Even though they're performing miracles. I'm like, okay. Okay, you got my attention a little bit more, right? Let's talk about this a little bit more. So here's what I need you to understand. There are some people, pastors, people who have been in the church, people, whatever, that are actively trying to confuse you. Their goal to get up every Sunday morning is to confuse you because Satan has got his way into their life and they, he has made sure they got a good audience every Sunday. I bet they're big audiences every Sunday. And they are actively trying to confuse you. Then there are others 
who aren't actively trying to confuse you. They just maybe, they're teaching what they were taught, not what the scripture says. And it's like, okay, they're trying, but they're not quite there yet, okay? And then you've got some people who's like, okay, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go read it myself. Absolutely, you should always go home. You should always read it yourself. You should have a good Bible at home. But do you understand what the Bible is saying? Because sometimes it's like, that was sort of hard to understand. And we're going to get into a few of these things today. That was sort of hard to understand. So have you put in the time and effort to, or are you just trusting everybody else for your salvation? Well, he said I'm good, so obviously I'm good, right? I don't know. Maybe we need to check this a little bit. In Romans chapter 10, we're going to spend some time here. A lot of people like to go here. This is the um, a good, if you grew up Baptist, um, or if we're doing everything we can to make following Jesus easy, here's the chapter we go to. So I want to go to this chapter, and let's, let's see what Scripture says in the context that it says it. And then let's figure out from there. All right. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved. Okay, let's stop right there, right? So Paul is writing a letter to the church in Rome. That's where we get Romans. And most of them are Gentiles. But it seems to me, Paul being a good Jewish man, he feels a certain way about his fellow Jews, so he writes this letter, but in chapter 10, he is like, how about for, a shout out for my boys here, right? We're going to dive into all the Jewish people and what they have to say. So all of a sudden, it goes from having no expectations because uh, Gentiles weren't allowed in the family of God for so long until Jesus to the people who have always been the family of God. And they already know what they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be doing it. They already have the prayers down. They have their scripture memorized. They have all the above. They've already got so much of the foundation laid that it's different than when he's talking to the Gentiles. And if we just run right past the fact that he says, uh, and my desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved because he has switched his focus from the majority of us, the Gentiles, to the Israelites. So let's keep that in mind as we go along here. For I can testify about them, and, they're, uh, and they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. It's not based on this relationship. They don't know God. What do they know? Well, let's, let's keep going here. Since they did not know uh, the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. He's saying, you guys didn't know Jesus, but this whole law was set up and pointing to Jesus. You, didn't just, you just didn't know it was Jesus yet. So you guys are like already into the race that you didn't know here was the finish line. You were just running because God told me I'm supposed to be in a race, so I'm in a race. He said, go run, I'm running. I don't know why I'm running. I don't know where the finish line is. I don't know when we're going to stop. But I'm going to do what God's... Because the way that the Jewish people showed God that they loved them, obedience. It wasn't worship. It wasn't anything. It was, am I obeying what he said to do? He said, go do this, I'm in. Period. I don't, like, if he's Lord of my life. He says do it. It's just like when, you're, when your parents tell you to do something, especially when you're younger. Hey, I need you to go do this. But why? Because I said right now, one of these days you're going to understand that I'm trying to make you a responsible adult. I'm trying to give you some responsibility in the house so when you get your own place, you're going to be able to live comfortably. But right now, it's because I'm the authority in your life and you also need to learn to respect authority. Some of us don't like that very much, right? Like that's a, that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow. God's this way with the Jewish people. He's like, because I said, and they're like, Bet, I'm in. And they go along with this. And then to show who he's writing to even more, because he knows his audience, in verse 5, Moses writes, oh, he brought in the big dog, right? Like if there's anyone that they got to listen to, Moses is one of the top ones, and he's reminding them, so he's speaking their language. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. 
The person who does the things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Let me stop here. If you have your Bibles, I don't think it has it up here, but you see the quotes, right? What he's doing is he's quoting their scripture that they have memorized. He's quoting out of Deuteronomy. Because as soon as he starts talking about salvation and understanding God, they start going to the Bible verses they know, right? You would go to John 3.16. As soon as somebody starts talking about what do I need to do, you're like, John 3.16. Why? Because our culture has inundated us with it. They start going to their scripture. They're like, Deuteronomy, I'm going to go there. And if you've got your Bibles, you'll go through and they'll see a little letter afterwards and it'll tell you where in Deuteronomy to go. So he's quoting their scripture so that they're already starting in a place where we aren't. Because if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 where they're talking about this, he's talking about what they should be doing and how they should be acting, the actions that they need to take. So as soon as he says this, they trigger this. And they're like, I'm with you. Keep going. So he does. Um, let's uh, pick this up in verse 8 because that's all confusing to us, right? Who's going to go down? Who's going to come up? Who's going to... What? Well, they get it because they understand Deuteronomy. We haven't gone back to Deuteronomy yet, so we don't get it. So let's just keep moving. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. So one of the things that the Jewish people do to try to have a relationship with God is they, uh, they quote a certain prayer, the Shema. They say it every morning. They say it every evening. It's just to remind them, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one right? Because there's so many different gods out there that are vying for their attention. They say it every day to remind them, there's only one God, and he is my God. There's only one God, and he is my God. There's only one God, and he is my God. So Paul is saying, agreed, but your one God also includes Jesus. He's trying to add Jesus into this prayer that they have. Because it's already on their hearts and in their mouths, which is what, if you look at uh, the Shema, and you look about what the Jewish people are doing, I mean, they have the phylacteries that they put on their arms. They have the boxes that they keep on their heads. They have the things they put on their door frames. This is all from the Shema. It needs to, the word, God's word needs to be hidden in your heart, and it needs to be on your lips. So he's saying stuff. He's quoting scripture that they already know that we don't recognize most of the time that he's quoting and then he says in verse 9, which is one of these things that if a pastor's trying to make it as easy as they possibly can, put in our pockets and we throw it out to everybody, right? If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. Well, that seems awfully nice. I bet a lot of people on that wide road, somebody taught them this and they're like, I'm in. And Jesus is like, excuse me, what's your name? I'd love to meet you. Like, can we have a relationship? Because all I have to do is think it? I think a lot of things that I know aren't true. <laughs> I've said a lot of things that I know aren't true. But this is different for the Jewish people, but he's saying, add this into the prayer that you pray every day. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Add this into the actions that you're taking every day in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and you go, add this in with those. It's not just about what you think. It's not just about what you believe. He goes on here. Um, let's start in verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it is written with your heart that you will believe and you are justified, and it is with your mouth that you will prof uh, profess your faith that you are saved. How do I know that you're a good Jew? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. We all say the same prayer. We all recognize each other. We all see each other as we go to temple. Like, he's saying, guys, just keep doing the same thing and add Jesus in there. He, he's just adding to what they are already doing. As Scripture says, so he's quoting their Bible again, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord of all uh, and richly blesses all who call on him. Let's stop there for a second. Are there differences between Jews and Gentiles? Absolutely there are differences the Jewish people only eat certain things. They only go certain places. They only say certain prayers. He's not saying that they're... 
that there's no differences. Later on, he says, there's no difference between male and female, uh, Jew or Gentile. Like, are there differences between male and female? Absolutely. What he's saying is, everyone is welcome now. Everyone. There's no difference whether you're Jew or Gentile, part of the family. Welcome. It doesn't matter. He's saying, when it comes to my love, when it comes to my family, there are no longer any dividing lines. Everyone is welcome because of what Jesus did. So we can't just like, let's think about this for a second as we go along through here. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, that's two times. It's like, okay, this is the verse where we all like to go to. All I got to do is call on the name. You think anybody's ever, have you ever called on the name of Jesus? And then you were like, you know what? I was feeling a certain way that day, but I'm not anymore and I'm over here now, right? I, I'm going back to my old team. Yes. Verse 14. How then can they call the name they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? Or how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Or how can, they pre how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. So he's saying here, what we have to add in it's calling on the name of Jesus. What we have to add in, because he's talking to the Jewish people, what we have to add in, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Jesus is now part of that Lord. Jesus, is, that needs to add in to everything else I'm already doing. We are saved by grace through faith, period. Aren't those good Christian church words? So, so tell me what I'm supposed to do. Just confess. Yes, cool. I've confessed a lot of things that I don't believe in. So he's saying, add to this everything the Jewish people are already doing. It's not just believe and confess. There is more to it. Because here's the deal. Here's what we've got to recognize. And this is what I think we forget so often. And it's just so simplistic. It doesn't matter if you believe that you are following Jesus. It matters if he believes that you are following him right? We can trick ourselves sometimes. Oh, I, I'm doing it. Even when you're showing up on Sunday morning, even when you're reading your Bible, even when you got your Christian music on in the background. Sometimes it, it becomes the habit, right? It's not my heart anymore. It's just the habit. And he's like, guys, I knew you at one time and you walked away, but maybe it's time to come back. Or, I never knew you. Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't have grandchildren. <laughs> well, my mom's a Christian. You know, my grandma, she's a Christian. So as good as like, no, 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 no. Mm -mm, we're not doing that. Does Jesus know you? Not, do you know somebody who knows Jesus? It's not like getting you into a, a party or a friend's house or something like that. Well, I'm with so-and-so, so I can get in, right? No, no. You can only be with Jesus. So we've got to get this right. So I want people to understand that what's going on there in, in Romans chapter 10. Let's continue to, let's look at scripture overall. What does scripture overall say? Rather than one chapter out of this. Let's look at what it says overall when it's talking to Gentiles. Matthew chapter 28, verses 17 through 20. This is Jesus telling his disciples how to go make more disciples. A disciple is a mature Christian. We want you to be a very mature Christian, but a Christian is somebody who's like baby in their faith, right? Which is good. Are you following Jesus? That's what I like to say now because it tells me what I should be doing. Am I following Jesus? Am I actively doing what he asks me to do? Now I can check the boxes because I just need to keep it simple, stupid, right? So am I doing what he tells me to do? Cool, let's go. 28, starting in verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I like that. Some doubted. You can still have some doubts and follow Jesus, especially at the beginning. You get later on, you start, they introduce you to the new scripture, you're like, whoa, and you're allowed to have some doubts and follow Jesus. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Not just the law, not just, you know, the Torah. I'm in charge now. Therefore, go and make disciples, not Christians, disciples. We want you to mature in your faith. 
We want you to grow in your faith so that you can pass this on and you can do this with other people. Well, what am I supposed to do? I'm glad you asked. Make disciples of all nations. What am I supposed to do first? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Sounds like it's time to get dunked. Right? And, and they're over there in Israel. I'll let you know, like, I was in the desert for a long time. The first four days we were in the desert, there isn't water. <laughs> but they know this is on the checklist. So I'm going to do this as soon as I get the opportunity, right? So go and make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if I'm going making disciples, I've been around for a while, it's going to take me a while to teach you everything that I know. Some of you all know like one thing, get to teaching it. That's it. Get to teaching it. You're supposed to be making disciples. You can be one step ahead of whoever you're talking to. It's fine. And he says, and surely I will be with you till the very end of the age. I got you because you're going to mess up. But I got you. I'm going to fill in the blanks. I'm going to put other people around. We're going to be good. The goal is a mature disciple of Jesus, not a Christian. A mature disciple of Jesus. That is the goal. The goal is when I decide to say yes to Jesus and I cross over that line, the race now begins. I didn't cross the finish line. I crossed the starting line. And now it's time to get work. All right? Also, according to Scripture, here's, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to baptize them. Um, if you haven't been baptized, why not? Some people were like, well, you know, I'm standing on my theological understanding. And stuff. Well, your theological understanding, Jesus said, everyone needs to go get baptized. Is it part of the salvation process or not? It doesn't matter. Have you been baptized? He said, go get baptized, period. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe I should get done. We're in the United States right now. We have a horse trough full of water over here. We can make it a bit, we got it warm, right? Like we're not in Israel in the desert where it's like, oh, I'm supposed to get baptized. There's sand, there's sand. Hey, there's some more sand there's more. I thought I saw a tree. No, that wasn't a tree. That was a shadow. More sand. Like, it was a little bit different for them. But they knew, like, when this comes along, I need to take this opportunity. So if you haven't been baptized and you say you're following Jesus, are you following Jesus? Let's keep going. Because that's what Jesus taught. But let's just keep going. So he, Jesus taught that to his disciples. So what are his disciples teaching? We get here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter has just given his sermon to the people. What is Peter's powerful sermon? Blah, blah, blah. Jesus was God. You killed him. Every time he preaches, it's the same sermon. It's like I go to church every Sunday. The preacher teaches the same sermon every Sunday. Somehow it works for Peter. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus was God. You killed him. Wow. So he just gave that. It sounds a little bit different. You can go read it. And then Peter replied... Somebody asked him, what should we do then? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You need to repent. So here's one of those things that oftentimes we can't see. It's like, I made this decision in my head. Repenting is turning and walking in the opposite direction of where you were. It was a military term. So now I've got to fight against some of those sins that I got really good at. Like I put in effort. I was trying to be good at these things, and now I'm good. And it's going to take me an awfully long time to unwind these things. Like, it ain't going away today. Some of them might, but some of them you're going to have to be fighting against for a good long time. But I should see some actions changing in your life. There should be some evidence that you have made this decision. What's some other physical evidence we can see? Oh, get dunked in some water. <laughs> Go get baptized. Repent and be baptized. So Jesus taught them that. They taught everyone else that. Seems like, okay, this seems like an important thing. So um, you're supposed to be repenting. You're supposed to be getting baptized. They did baptism by immersion, so that's what we do. So when we come, get dunked. We got extra towels. We got extra shirts over here. If you're like, I wasn't planning on this, but yes, Lord, you're like jumping on me a little bit here. What's the worst thing you're going to do? Go home wet? That's the, that's the hardest thing is like, I had to drive home wet. And like, that's the worst thing. That's a big sacrifice you made there, wet. It's like coming home from the pool or the lake. Congratulations. Welcome to the party. Anyways, let's keep going. 
And who's this promise for, Peter? This promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, and for all who the Lord our God will call. He's calling every one of us. And some of us are listening. And some of us got too many other things going on in the back of our head, and we're not listening so much right now, right? With many words, uh, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That seems like a, we could say that today, right? Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. What am I supposed to do? Just do what I told you to do. That's how you save yourself. You put me in charge, and I do all the cleaning, <laughs> as you stop doing some of these things and you start doing other things. So we got to get this right. Finally, Ephesians. Paul says this. We're going to keep rolling here. I'm, woo, I knew it was going to be fun today. Um, finally, we see in Ephesians, Paul tries to clear this up because the thing that marks you, how do I know I'm part of the team? Coach, give me a jersey. Put me in. How do I know I'm part of the team? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, Welcome, I just shared this with you. The gospel of your salvation, when you believed it, because there's sometimes you heard it and you was like, I don't know, I don't know if I trust that a whole bunch. And sometimes you're like, yeah. And you believed it, and you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The thing that gets you into heaven, the thing that says you are part of the team, is not sitting here on Sunday. It's not owning a Bible. It's not your worship music in your car. It is the Holy Spirit being in charge of your life. And we've talked about this before. We talk about demons possessing us because they're in charge. But we have the Holy Spirit. It's like, I don't know. I feel like maybe he's in charge. So when the Holy Spirit is in charge of our lives and he has taken over, that's how we know we're in. And so often in Scripture, there are a couple of places, like Romans chapter 10, where they will say they received the Holy Spirit, but they did, had not been baptized. But the first thing they tell them to do is go get baptized. Normally, the place you receive the Holy Spirit is at baptism. Some of you will say, Scott, it didn't happen to me like that. And I'll be like, he's God and I'm not. Like if he wants to give you the Holy Spirit at a different place besides a horse trough or a lake or a pool, he's in charge. He's allowed to do that. I'm not saying that doesn't count. I'm not in charge. But what I normally see in Scripture is, the two are tied together for some reason. So I'm just going to do that because getting dunked isn't all that hard. This is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise and glory. All of us are now possessed by God once we have the Holy Spirit. Let's do that. So today you have heard the message, the gospel of your salvation. Jesus came. He left heaven, came and lived on this earth, died on a cross for you and me, not for him. He didn't need it. Conquered death and went back into heaven again so that we could have a relationship with him, not go through the priest, not go through the temple, not, not a, a sacrificial goat once a year. We can have a relationship with him. I like that idea. So the question now is, do you believe what you have been taught? I have done my job. James chapter 3, verse 1. I have done my job. I feel good about it. Some of you today are going to be like, yeah, I didn't get it before, but now I get it. And it's time to take the next step. And some of you are like, man, that guy was, he was a fool. He was all over the place. But I like the music. The music was good, and you're going to leave, and it's going to be fine, right? It ain't going to be the first time that it happened. But if God is putting it on your heart today, it seems like today you should be doing it. You need to be, believe. You need to confess. And we do that when we uh, baptize people here. We will take your confession. We will dunk you. We will also bring you back up, depending upon... Mm -hmm. Some of y'all need to stay down a little bit longer. It, it is what it is. We all know it. We all know it. Hmm. But we will bring you back up. And here's another one of those things, like Acts chapter 8. They're in the desert again. They call it the wilderness. Anytime you see the wilderness in Scripture, what they mean is desert. So it's like, okay. And as they were traveling along the road, they came to some water. This is uh, Stephen has gone to this Ethiopian eunuch. He's running up next to him. Hears that he's reading the Bible. He's like, man, I know something about that. 
Let me tell you something about that. And he reads the Bible, and he says, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Because they hadn't seen water. But somehow, this Ethiopian eunuch knew one of the steps is getting dunked. Boy, I haven't seen water in a while. Is there anything to keep me from getting baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, and Philip was baptized. Period. You need to believe. It is by grace, through faith. God does all the heavy lifting. There is nothing magical about what we do. But he says, here's what we do. I need you to take these steps if you want to be part of the family. So some of you didn't plan on this walking in here today. And it might be time. There are some of you that we contacted in advance hmm, that you came ready. But today, if you have decided it's time, you can meet me over here.